And our first speaker is going to be Adrian Butler from Imperial. And we're going to get a bit of a retrospective, I think, on uh, low car. Adrian. I've even brought my stopwatch. Uh, well, thank you. Um, and uh, thank you to Beth, actually. Um, I've got a new acronym for you. It's LUE, that's L-U-C-A, uh, sorry, L-U-A-E, that's life, the universe, and everything. Um, I'd like to, uh, well, you've heard a lot about low car, and so I thought it would be very fitting, because of the nature of this symposium, to tell you a bit about it, uh, and really to draw some points which I think are very important in terms of what a well-managed, integrated research program can produce uh, and the legacies that can come from that. Uh, it's so large that um, I will just draw from a few points uh, by way of illustration. So I'm particularly going to be looking at this document here, which was produced by Howard, by Dennis, myself, by Neil, Beth, and so forth. Um, so, and what I'd like to do, if we, by way of background, um, <laughs> we're a bit of a small place, uh, particularly when you start to think about it in terms of Canada, but what we lack in size, we make up, I think, in geological diversity. In fact, you could argue that the geological map of Great Britain is a thing of beauty and certainly Dennis Peachwood. <laughs> uh, it's highly variable, as you can see, uh, covering an enormous time scale, pre-Cambrian and even younger, up to, obviously, to the Anthropocene. Uh, but basically, if we, we could sort of largely say to the north and to the west, you've got old hard rocks, and to the south and to the east, you've got younger, um, softer sedimentary rocks. Now, if we think about the uplands, uh, they were very important and they were very much a focus of research prior to 1990. Our major reservoirs were there which were providing water to large metropolitan areas. Uh, because of the nature of the land use, there were issues over water quality and there were certain aspects of of land use change taking place, deforestation, and perhaps many of you are familiar with Clin Limon and the work that was done in Wales. But it did mean that there was this um, neglect of the lowlands, this bit over here, where there's a lot of people living, and of course, particularly London. The nature of the landscape means it's a large amount of agriculture, We've got uh, major river systems such as the Thames uh, and, and uh, we've also got the Trent and the, and the, Seven, uh, and the Seven, but we've also got um, key water resources both in terms of surface and groundwater. But we've also got low rainfall. Uh, and that map very nicely illustrates it where you can see very large amounts of rainfall taking place. This is in 2011, but you can see over here very low amounts of rainfall, and of course that is where a lot of people want their water. So because of this, there was a real need to address lowland catchment research. And so in the late 1990s, Howard and Dennis put together um, a proposal to the Natural Environment Research Council, uh, which ended up getting 10 million pounds of investment. Now, it's interesting. I think we last night did a quick mental calculation. I think that translates for around about 25 million Canadian dollars, if someone can correct me if that's right. And if so, Torsten, that's one of the answers to your question that you raised this morning. Uh, it involved 2 million pounds of infrastructure and then 8 million pounds being spent on research projects. And the aim was to develop new interdisciplinary science for integrated catchment management. There were three, whoops, there were three uh, 
experimental catchments up in Shropshire, up in the Midlands, on the Permo-Triassic sandstones. Uh, we had the Turn catchment. And then uh, down in the south, I won't talk much about this, but there was the Froome, Piddle, and Chalk catchment. And then over here, as part of the Thames uh, catchment, we had the Pang and Lambourne. And the main period which most of the research was done between, was between 2003 and 2008. And so there was a huge range of projects. I'm certainly not going to talk about any, any of them apart from this one really in, in, in any detail, but uh, it just gives you a whole range of scope where we're looking at uh, evaporation, the role of vegetation, where you have um, glacial drift deposits on top of aquifers, how does recharge work in there, obviously the effect of agrochemicals, how we characterize groundwater flow in these landscapes and how it interacts with the surface water and of course there's all the ecological aspects, sediment and so forth. So, and, w and one of the nice things is there's a, there's a nice paper in Hess published in 2007 which very much uh, gives you a nice overview of the program as a whole. But the title of my talk is The Legacy of Low Car and uh, I would like to argue that we have six aspects to it in terms of legacy. And again, I want to perhaps think about this not just in terms of LOCAR itself, but perhaps in terms of any of your sort of major programs. There's infrastructure. That infrastructure, of course, gives rise to data. The analysis of, that, of those data hopefully provides knowledge. We can communicate that knowledge to people, to stakeholders, to regulators, uh, incorporate it into policy. We can also educate people. And finally, there are the people who are involved uh, themselves. So I just really want to very quickly go through those aspects and draw some of those out in terms of what we achieved with LOCAR. So this is uh, a picture of that Pang Lambourne catchment there. And here you can see a whole range of different sites collecting water quality data, river flow data, groundwater levels and chemistry data, uh, ecological data, and so on and so forth. Um, I'm just going to focus on this site, uh, known very well to Dennis and myself, Trumplet Farm. And there it is. It's connected to um, a, a, a groundwater um, abstraction well, which was, uh, is available to augment flow on the Thames. And what we were able to do was to put in a range of boreholes around that and use that as a site to characterize groundwater flow. And there are various papers that we've published on that. But um, one of the nice things is we've kept that infrastructure in. And so uh, recent years, when I've been working on looking at saltwater intrusion into, uh, into coastal aquifers, and we were trying to use this remote sensing technique using self-potentials, uh, and we were collecting data on the south coast, and we needed to contrast the data we were collecting with an inland site. Well, of course, we had, uh, we had the Trumplets farm site, that PL10 site, uh, with all of the uh, knowledge that we'd gained from LOCAR to provide a reference point. Uh, in addition, um, a whole range of recharge sites were set up in the Pang Landborn catchment, uh, with an integrated data collection of uh, tensiometers, neutron probes, uh, um, uh, theta probes, and so forth. Uh, and, and these were, um, along with um, water quality data in terms of uh, a whole range of parameters, but just to illustrate here, we've got um, the spatial distribution of nitrogen uh, in groundwater, but we also had that uh, in terms of profiles, so nitrate profiles in the unsaturated chalk. And so, uh, with our recharge site data, we had this fantastic data set that Andrew Ierson worked on. It's a real shame he's not here um, uh, this, uh, for this uh, symposium. Um, but we collected this uh, magnificent time series data uh, that we were able to then develop modeling uh, tools to understand what was taking place there. And so, with all that infrastructure, with all that data, of course, when we could then start thinking about, well, what are we learning from it? What, do we, what can we know? Well, there were some interesting issues in the chalk. Uh, it's a very interesting rock. I'll tell you a little bit more about it in a minute. But uh, there were some questions such as, why does nitrate move so slowly 
of the order of a meter a year. But the water table can respond within a day, even at 40, 50 meters down, uh, to heavy recharge. So that's an interesting question. Uh, and um, I, ju I put this in. Jeff uh, very nicely illustrated the uh, usefulness of, uh, for example, tritium data. And we have uh, such data on the, uh, uh, on the catchment which illustrates this slow movement. Uh, as you can see, this is 1970. So you've only got roughly five meters of movement of tritium um, uh, when that profile was taken. By contrast, here we have this is data which was collected during low car. Um, and we have then this uh, very heavy rainfall event in July 2007, and this is, the water table is 20 meters below the surface, and look at that rise taking place. So we're seeing this really fast recharge taking place. So we have that question. There's another one which uh, was observed during the 1976 drought, uh, which was the, really one of our most severe droughts, depends on how you want to sort of talk about a drought, but uh, by most standards, it was a very severe drought. Uh, water balance calculations done on the River Lambourne uh, during August appeared to show far more base flow taking place in the river than was possible given the specific yield of the chalk. So that was a conundrum. Uh, and then given this, you know, what are all the implications for the long-term water quality and ecology of chalk rivers in the, in the Thames catchment? So these are some of the issues that really we wanted to try and address uh, in Lokar. Now the chalk, as I say, is a fascinating rock. Um, it's made, oh, it's the wrong one, there we go. It's made from these uh, tiny algal, uh, skeletal algal remains of about a, mi a micron in size. Uh, that forms the matrix. <coughs> but that matrix is then <coughs> fractured. So we have this fracture matrix uh, system, this dual, uh, not just dual porosity, but dual permeability. Uh, I'm going to get the right button in a minute. So the, the matrix has some conductivity of about a millimeter a day. Uh, it has very high storage of 30 to 40 percent, whereas the fractures are highly conductive, but have a very low storage of the order of 1 percent. And a lot of people, when they'd been looking at the modeling that system, had really used this very, very simple, almost block fracture matrix model. And one of the great advantages of LOCAR was we were able to start to think about this right the way up to the surface and to start to think about what is the role of the surface in terms of um, these processes. So what we see is we've got this competent rot at rock at the bottom, but at the top we've got this soil layer of about 20 centimeters. Uh, and that soil layer provides a lot of storage. And what it means is that, um, in fact, if I just go back, what you've got here is a buffer zone. So the way you get, of course, remember, you, if we've got a matrix permeability of about one millimeter a day, that's virtually exceeding any rainfall event. But, of course, if you can store uh, the water in that top zone and, as it were, slow it down, to a rate such that the matrix can then take it and move it down, then you've got an ability to start to understand that slow nitrate movement. In addition, but of course we've got these fast recharge events, so we, we had, uh, Andrew and I came up with a method of defining um, rainfall. We looked at, uh, we defined it in an event, we looked at the duration, we looked at the intensity, and we plotted them um, on this uh, graph. Um, so these are all our events. These events were all caused um, a response in the water table, uh, 20 meters depth. These green ones did, all the blue ones didn't. And then we started to find that we could have these zones where the top zone is, it doesn't seem to matter what the duration or intensity of the event, if it was in this zone, it caused a, a recharge response. In here, some did, most didn't, and then below here, none did. And so what we were able to do was then to start to see that, in fact, those green events, the ones seemed to occur when there was very um, high water content. So what we were able to do then subsequently is through modeling, we could look at the effects of bypass flow 
uh, occurring and then understand how the nature of the events could give rise to these bypass responses, but by and large, you would just get matrix flow. So we got this knowledge, we developed it through um, Simon Mathias did a PhD, uh, which really postulated that. Andrew Ierson came along with his PhD and demonstrated it from, uh, the, uh, from the data we collected in LOCAR, and we produced this um, evidence of this slow drainage response and that helped to explain why in the 1976 drought we were still seeing base flow because we had that big unsaturated zone drainage. Uh, the thickness of the unsaturated zone meant that that movement of nitrates through that system was extremely slow. This picks up the point that uh, uh, Nicholas was making this morning and Beth Jackson uh, and colleagues at Reading uh, were, were able to do, which was to um, show how that slow movement of nitrate meant we had this nitrate time bomb looking into the future as uh, nitrate would continue to rise as the pulses of nitrate, because of agricultural practice, were still working their way through the system. In terms of communication, we think about 125 journal papers, 35 conference papers, 10 PhD theses, 10 MSc theses, and that's just my estimate. Um, uh, um, we had lots of engagement with stakeholders in terms of uh, uh, government, with the regulators, with water industry, and so forth. And we had education. And here is my MSc class. This was back in um, November. And I think the caption for this one is... <laughs> um, and then, finally, people. So just to show you, some of these people, these were either PhD students or postdocs. Obviously, a few of them you know. Um, but look, uh, Simon Mathias, now Professor of Computational Geoscience at Durham. Andrew, of course, has made a great success out here. Beth, you just saw. Uh, and, and Nicholas, uh, you heard earlier. And then finally, I think the legacy is this. I would like to argue that changing cold regions research network, I think, is one of the legacies of LOCAR. Uh, because I, as I was watching the film on Tuesday night, uh, it really struck me that what you had there was low car on a big scale. So that's the legacy I think I'd, I would like to say low car has left. Thank you very much. Um, gosh, that's a, that's a tricky question because you, you tend to be biased. <laughs> um, I think the problem is, as good as it was, there are still a lot we didn't really answer. And, and I, think, um, I think there's so much more. Well, I think what's important, I think what, how you get those detailed processes, sort of thing that Jeff was talking about this morning, and how you put them uh, in integrated models, the sort of work that Beth would demonstrating, and really how do we start to do those up and get those tools that we can then use for really addressing the questions that uh, people have, policymakers and so forth, but in a way that you can really communicate and engage. And I think what Beth has been doing, I think is terrific in that sense of, uh, and so I still think, you know, that we, we've still got a lot of fundamental pro processes, Dennis and I still argue about how we, trying to understand the flow of the chalk and the groundwater system is still very complicated. I think how you integrate groundwater into models is still a major challenge, uh, particularly looking at the borehole scale to the aquifer scale, um, because that's where people get their water, it's at the borehole. You know, so there's still lots of questions. So. But as I say, I'm biased. Um, I think if you got another person, they'd give you a different answer. <laughs> Thanks, Adrian. Thank you.